السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر أن الله يعلم ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ما يكون من نجوى ثلاثة إلا هو رابعهم ولا خمسة إلا هو سادسهم ولا أدنى من ذلك ولا أكثر إلا هو معهم أينما كانوا ثم ينبئهم بما عملوا يوم القيامة إن الله بكل شيء عليم ألم تر إلى الذين نهوا عن النجوى ثم يعودون لما نهوا عنه ويتناجون بالإثم والعدوان ومعصية الرسول وإذا جاءوك حيوك بما لم يحيك به الله ويقولون في أنفسهم لولا يعذبنا الله بما نقول حسبهم جهنم يصلونها فبئس المصير Starting from this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us some adab, some manners that we need to observe in our life. Scholars have said, Ad-deenu kulluhu adab. Our deen is full of adab, respect and manners. <coughs> In this deen, if you perform things according to the deen, you will always be performing things in their proper way of performing them and the proper manners of performing things. <coughs> this is the beauty of our deen, that as it teaches us to do things or orders us to do things, at the same time, it teaches us the best way of doing it also. <coughs> and there isn't any aspect of our life that we have to go through in our life and Dean will not teach us the proper manners of performing it. To the extent that Deen teaches us the manners of walking, of talking, of sitting, standing up, of laughing, manners of crying, manners of dressing, manners of sleeping, manners of waking up, manners of leaving home, manners of entering home, and you name anything. And you would find instructions, beautiful instructions about it in our deen. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started the ayah by a belief. Something that we all believe in. Something that each and every mu'min has to believe in. It's a reminder so that we can remember the rest of the adab and realize that many times these adab can be very important because as you neglect that adab, you are not only disrespecting each other or you are not only harming each other, you may be neglecting the adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Don't you see that Allah knows whatever is in the heaven and the earth? Staring it with a question. Simply means, we all know it. 
We all believe in this. Don't you see that this is a fact? That Allah knows whatever is in the heaven and the earth. And once you see that, simply means we believe in it as we are seeing it. This is the type of Iman we have to have in this faith, in this Iman, or in this part of our Iman that Allah knows everything that goes on in the heaven and the earth. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Not a single leaf falls of a tree without the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many trees are in the world? <coughs> and how many leaves are on those trees? How many leaves grow on the tree each day and how many leaves are falling each day if we were to keep track of that we would fail all of our technology all of our science and every advancement that we have in every field put it together to just have that knowledge and we will fail and here we can realize that not to talk about all the information that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, just this one small thing. And I made it much easier for ourselves to compete and to understand otherwise. As I said that each day if we try to see how many leaves are growing and how many leaves are falling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only of each day, he knows it about each and every second. In which part of the world, from which tree, which leaf fell off, and which tree had a new leaf on it. And there isn't anything in the universe that takes place, whether it's that leaf or anything smaller than that, or anything larger than that. Without the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing can take place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of this iman, of this faith. That alam tara anna Allah ya'lamu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard? Don't you see that Allah knows whatever, whatever, no exclusions. Whatever is in the heaven and whatever is in the earth. And if he knows all of this, then he's coming to a specific topic now. For which he's reminding us of this iman and this faith. Whenever a private and a secret conversation is taking place between three people, Allah says, I'm the fourth over there. No three people can have a secret conversation without having Allah being over there hearing them. And not even five people can hold a secret talk and conversation without having Allah to be the sixth of those. Nor less than this, wala akthar, nor greater than this. It can be any number. Illa huwa ma'ahum aynama kanu. Unless Allah is with them, wherever they might be. Wherever they might be. So this is the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. After reminding us of that iman. Our Iman is Allah is aware of everything. Normally people hold private conversation so that other people will not find out about it. That's the main purpose. Why would you talk so secretly? Why would you whisper to others? You don't want anyone else to hear it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us 
that whether anyone else will find out or not, I know it. Make sure that private conversation that you're holding, that whispering that is going between you people, is not against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's hearing all of it. ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Then on the day of judgment, he would inform them of whatever they have done. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah is well aware of everything. And still, now Allah will give us more instructions about our private conversations in the next ayahs. But there are a few points that we need to learn from this ayah before we proceed to the next ayahs. One is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say when a conversation is taking place, private secret talk is taking place between two people, Allah is the third of those. He said when it's taking place between three, Allah is the fourth. Although the, and he told us, Wala adna min dhalik, neither less than this nor more than five, unless Allah is with them. But why did he start with three and not two? One wisdom behind it that we can understand is whenever we have a number of people, we should always, as Allah subhanahu wa sallallahu said in a hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and he likes the odd number. When you consider the odd number, don't consider Allah to be one of those. Allah is everywhere. Just count your souls. And whenever you are having any of those numbers, so if you have three, then that is your odd number. Don't count Allah as the fourth and you, don't, and you consider that we are not in an odd number. So in order to have an odd number, we will have two of us, so Allah is the third of us. No. Allah says, I am everywhere. But you are going to be counted separate than my count. When three of you are there, I am the fourth, but I am separate. So we are not going to count the angels on our sides. We are not going to count Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala neither. We will just count ourselves. The other thing is to inform us that odd number is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always likes everything every good thing to take place in an odd number. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tried to keep that in mind at all the time whenever he would perform something, he's applying perfume, he would put it in an odd number. Tasbihat in the salah, three times, five, or in an odd number. He's putting the kuhl, whatever you call it, in the eyes, he would put it in the odd number. So he would always make sure that he would perform things in an odd number. Therefore, when we perform the wudu, we wash the pads of our body also each pad in an odd number, which is three times. The second point that we need to remember from this ayah and understand from this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَمَا كَانُوا he is with them wherever they might be. The thing that we need to learn from this, no matter who's doing what in the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. If the whole world will get together to harm one person, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect that person, no one will be able to harm that person. Allah is there. Whether someone else is there for him or not, Allah is there for him. Number three. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, wherever you may be, and whoever that person might be, I'm with that person wherever. إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كَانُوا He's with them wherever they might be. And here, some people 
raise a question, where is Allah? And then we try to raise this question to confuse people about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people as I travel, they ask this question because they have been confused by some people who would just go from place to place. Asking a person who have been Muslim for about five, seven years, two, three years, they would go and ask him, where is Allah? If he would say Allah is everywhere, you are kafir. Now that person, I, had, I, I was approached by some people, myself, that a person is totally worried. He said, you know, I thought I became Muslim five years back. And I'm doing my salah, I'm doing everything, and now I'm, I, I was told that all of that is wasted. All of that was meaningless. I wasn't Muslim. And now, to the extent that some people, they don't even like to remain in it anymore because I might, you might tell me this today, and after a few years, someone else will come to me and tell me, no, still your iman wasn't good. What is this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to bring people into the deen, not to force people out of deen. Of course, we have to teach the people the right thing. But those things where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the ayahs in such a way that we cannot really say anything confirm about it. We cannot just take one ayah and make a determination that this is iman and everything else is kufr wal ayazu billah. Remember about the existence of Allah. Where is Allah? We have ayahs of Al-Quran Al-Kareem that say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the heaven. And He's on His arsh, on His throne. And we have ayahs of Al-Quran Al-Kareem that are telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere, just like this ayah. إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَمَا كَانُوا He is with them wherever they might be. And these type of ayahs about things that we have not seen. Things that we can never see with our own eyes in this world. These physical eyes have no power of seeing those things. We only depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to inform us of those things. When we have two different type of ayahs about these things, we cannot use our opinion regarding this. This will fall into the category of al-mutashabihat. <coughs> For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُبَايِعُونَكَ إِنَّمَا يُبَايِعُونَ اللَّهِ يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Those who are taking the oath of allegiance on your hand, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, doing the bay'ah on your hand, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were not doing it on your hand, they were doing it on the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا يُبَايِعُونَ اللَّهِ they were doing, taking that bay'ah on the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Allah's hand was on top of their hand. Can we understand how Allah's hand was on top of their hand and how Allah was holding their hand with His hand? Except al-mutashabihat. We don't know nothing about it. Same thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his face in Quran al kareem But of course we cannot try to picture his face like our face. With the nose, with these eyes, with two eyes. And we can never picture the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to try to resemble his look like ours. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Nothing resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we don't know... If we have not even seen things that resemble Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we even imagine how He is? And that is the reason He gave us His attributes, His sifat. That if you want to know Allah, know Him through His attributes. 
Connect yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His attributes. Connect yourself through his, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Al Kareem, through Al Razzaq, through Al Halim, through Al Rahman, through Al Rahim. These are the connections with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to understand how He looks like, how He stands, how He talks, how He looks at things, how He sees things, how He hears things, we can never understand these things. He doesn't need these eyes to see things, He doesn't need these tongue to speak whatever He has to say, He doesn't need these legs to walk or to stand on it. He doesn't need these type of hands to hold things. And he doesn't need our type of chair to sit on because he does not need anything of his creatures. He doesn't need nothing that he have created. And when he tells us, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When he likes to get something, he only says to it, be. And the word used in Arabic, kun. And it is there that is also only for us to understand how he creates things. Otherwise, he doesn't even need the word kaf and noon. He doesn't have to use kun. He doesn't have to use it. He just wants it and it's there. So now when he talks about these paths, different things, his face, his hand, his existence up there, down here, all of these are al-mutashabihat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Qur'an, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ He tells us in the beginning of Surah Al Imran that he have revealed two type of ayahs in Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. One are called Al-Muhkamat, the other are called Mutashabihat. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Muhkamat are the ones that you are supposed to understand and follow. All the orders of Al-Quran Al-Kareem are Muhkamat, and majority of the ayahs of Al-Quran Al-Kareem are Al-Muhkamat. But there are some ayahs that are Al-Mutashabihati. Alif Lam Mim. Can someone translate that? Allahu A'lam. This is Mutashabihat. We don't know what does it mean. We don't know what does it stands for. It's his knowledge. We just take it the way it is. We don't understand it. وَأُخَرُ mutashabihat. He tells us that the second type of ayahs I have are al-mutashabihat. And as we determined that the ayah is about the existence of Allah, how he looks like, how he sits, how he speaks, all of these things about his beginning, his end, all of these are of al-mutashabihat. He tells us, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ Those whose hearts are off the track, those who have gone astray, those who are off the hidayah, those whose hearts are twisted, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ those are the people فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ They keep on searching for Al-Mutashabihat. They keep on running after Al-Mutashabihat. Why? For two reasons. And whichever of these two reasons might be the reason for the person to run after Al-Mutashabihat, Allah says, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغْ That person is off the track, his heart is twisted. <coughs> And what are the two reasons for which people might be running after al mutashabihat that he mentions in Quran? فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغْ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ Some people to create fitna in the ummah. You are not Muslim. You are like this. You are out of Islam. All of your salah wasn't accepted. This is fitna. ابتغاء الفتنة and number two ابتغاء تأويلي some people they are very sincere as we call it this word is very nice nowadays to be used that this brother this sister is very sincere and out of sincerity committing all of these sins out of the sincerity is bringing all of this haram in the masjid out of sincerity, 
causing all of this harm to the community, out of sincerity, destroying the whole ummah. But he's very sincere. And he's doing all of this out of sincerity. Allah doesn't want that type of sincerity. He doesn't want that. This is why he tells us, some people are after these ayahs, after al mutashabihat to seek the knowledge of it, to learn the meanings of it, to understand them. He's very sincere. He would like to learn it. <coughs> Allah says, you think you are sincere, and I'm telling you, fi qulubihim your heart is twisted. He's telling us so clearly, no one knows the real meaning of it except Allah. The people who are strong in the knowledge, who are firm in the knowledge, what they say about these ayahs, they tell us, we believe in it. When Allah says, I am on my throne, we say, MashaAllah, Allah is on the throne. When he says, I'm everywhere, we say Allah is everywhere. He is everywhere the way he is. He is on the throne the way he is. I don't know how he is there. I don't know how he is here. He is here. He is there. How? I don't know that. Now, if I don't understand how, then simple means I cannot object to neither this one nor to that one. If today someone would tell me, that, do you believe Allah is up on his throne? And I say, yes. Who's holding the throne? I would tell him, angels. Allah says in Quran, Eight angels are holding the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now if he would ask me, are these angels carrying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No objections. I'm not ready for any of these objections. Why? Because I didn't understand how he's there. Someone will ask me, is he everywhere? Yes, he says, We are closer to the human beings than their juggler wan. Someone asked me, is he everywhere with you? Yes. He wants to object. He's with you when you're in a bathroom, this, this. Wallahu alam how? But I know he is. Because he says he is. I'm not going to reject his word because of your objection. Because I haven't seen him. And no one has seen him. And these things will be decided not in this life, only in Akhirah. And it will be senseless to run after things that will be decided only on the Day of Judgment to try to decide them in this life. <clears throat> we cannot. And therefore, we should leave al mutashabihat the way they are. He says everywhere, we say Alhamdulillah, he's everywhere, this is my Iman. He says on his throne, I say this is Alhamdulillah, this is my Iman, he's there. He's there the way he is, he's everywhere the way he is. La yus'alu amma yaf'al. He cannot be questioned about nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that on the day of judgment I will inform you of everything that you have done in this life. In Allah Allah is well aware of everything. I think you can wait now because you, we started it. Alam tara ila alladheena nuhu anil najwa thumma ya'uduna lima nuhu anhu وَيَتَنَاجَوْنَ بِالْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ وَمَعْصِيَةِ الرَّسُولِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting into more detail about the private conversations. Don't you see, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at those who are forbidden to hold secret conversations and still they do whatever they were forbidden to do. These ayahs, according to Imam Siyuti rahimahullah, as he narrates in his book on the authority of Muqatil, 
were revealed about a special situation that took place at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that was when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'een immigrated to Medina Munawwara, they made a treaty with the Yahud in Medina. And according to that treaty, they could not harm each other. Now what they used to do was, whenever they see a Muslim passing by one of their streets, going through their marketplace, or passing through a place where the Muslim is by himself, or they are in a larger group and there are only few Muslims, these people will stand whispering to each other, pointing towards that Muslim. No purpose except to harass him. Just to scare the person. These people are new in Medina. And, of course, they cannot do anything to these people because of the treaty that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have made with them. So, just to hurt them, they will look at them and talk to each other, whisper to each other. Sometimes they will look at these Muslims and will keep on laughing so that it will hurt his feelings. That would, of course, create a very bad atmosphere. It's enough to create that hatred in the people, in the hearts of the others when you have this type of attitude towards them. If you have made a treaty with the group of people, with any group of people, now be friendly to them, be nice to them, be welcoming to them. Don't stand making these type of things that will create more hatred in the community and that will keep everyone disturbed. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ بَعْدَ إِصْلَاحِهَا Do not commit mischief in the world after having a good place and after having a peace. So you're living in a peaceful atmosphere with these type of things, you are committing a mischief. So since it was a way of committing mischief over there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stopped them from doing anything of this kind. That we see you always doing it is not good. We cannot continue with that treaty if you people continue doing this. But still, they would not stop doing it. Alam tara ila ladina nuhu anil najwa. Allah says about that situation. Don't you see that those, that there are people, or don't you see it those who were forbidden to hold these type of secret conversations? And still, ya'udun alima nuhu an. They do the same thing that they were forbidden to do. And not only that these people do it in your presence. Now Allah says that I'm Allah. When I talk, then I talk very openly. When I talk, then I will reveal a lot of your secrets that these people cannot even see. So Allah is telling us that don't have a war against Allah. Don't do these things, these type of things that will get Allah angry with you. Because once he will do, then he will bring everything up front. Just like the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where he says, Every Muslim is supposed to cover up the faults of other Muslims. And nevertheless, a Muslim is not supposed to be running after these uh, shortcomings of other Muslims. He's always looking for those. Let me find this person doing something wrong so I can talk about it. I can publish that in my article. I can main mention it to the people so people will not have respect for him. I can humiliate this person and I have some secret agencies watching him so that we will know what he's doing in his day-to-day -day life. Try to catch something wrong that he's doing in his life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, a person who would try to find the shortcomings of other Muslims. Allah will humiliate him so much that he will be humiliated even within his own home because who doesn't do something wrong in his life? And 
if Allah, Allah says, you run after my servants and you commit that type of mischief where you are taking the peace of mind of those people away that they know that you are just there, you are watching them for their wrongdoings and you are always, they are always under watch and under all of this surveillance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then I am there. Then I will come into picture and I will help that person and the way I'm going to help him, he tells us how I'm going to help him. I will help him in this way that I will reveal your secret in such a way that even your own family members will disrespect you. They won't like to see your face anymore. He will, Allah says, I will dishonor him and put him so down that he will not even have respect within his own family members. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, I was mentioning that now Allah came into picture. These people were holding, they were whispering to each other just to scare these Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now as he told, he, he asked them to stop, they didn't stop. So now he's saying that, see, I told them to stop. Still, they did not stop. And not only this, And when they go home, they have secret talks about committing sins, about wrongdoings, about the wrongdoings. So not only that they're doing it when they're sitting in the streets and they're watching you people, this is only to scare you. That is not going to hurt you. But at the same time, these people, when they go back, in spite of those treaties that they have made with you, still they are planning against you. They have their secret talks about, about committing sins, about doing wrong to you people, and and about disobeying the Messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to mention one more thing that they used to do. وَإِذَا جَاءُوكَ حَيَّوكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهِ When they come to you, they greet you in a way that Allah have never greeted you in that way. When they come to you, وَإِذَا جَاءُوكَ حَيَّوكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهِ They greet you in such a way that Allah have not greeted you in that way. According to Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah, when these Yahud used to come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to <coughs> say, As-Samu alaykum instead of As-Salamu alaykum. Sam means death. When you remove the lamb out of Salam, then it becomes Sam. Uncle Sam. <laughs> And Sam means death. So, when they used to come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to say, As-Samu alayk, which means death on you. And they used to say it in such a way that, of course, you know, it's difficult to see, to hear properly what the person is saying if you want to say so no one would know what he said. One day, as they came and they said, As-Samu Aisha radiallahu anha was sitting behind the curtain in the house. The hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says that Aisha radiallahu anha heard these people saying As-Samu alaykum instead of as salamu alaykum. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied to them, But Aisha radiallahu anha was so upset. She said, Alaykum as-Sam wal-la'na. Death and the curse of Allah be on you people, not on us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Aisha radiallahu anha, Ya Aisha, alayki bil rif. Aisha, be polite. Ya Rasulullah, didn't you hear what they said? They didn't know, they never said assalamu alaikum, they said assalamu alaikum. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, replied, but didn't you hear what I said? I never said wa alaikum assalam, I just said wa alaikum. 
Same to you. <laughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yustajabu li fihim wa la yustajabu lahum fiya. Allah will accept my dua about them but will not accept their duas about me. So don't worry about it, Aisha. And here we learn that the reply there from their own Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it a rule that if anyone, any non-Muslim says, Assalamu alaykum, we greet us through the Islamic greeting, just say, Wa alaykum. But never start with Assalamu alaykum because Assalamu alaykum is the salam of the believers. And another point is, we should always keep our greeting the same. We should not change it because of our culture, because of the place that we live in, because of the language that we speak. And unfortunately, not to talk about other languages, even within the Arabic language themselves now. Sabah al khair. Good morning. Sabah al khair. Good morning. And a lot of these type of words have started that unfortunately are being said as a greeting instead of as-salam. And in many other languages we have the same thing. Just like in Urdu we use Khuda Hafiz at the end. And salam is at the beginning and salam is for the end also. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, when you come to a gathering, say salam, and before you leave those people, say the salam again, because فَلَيْسَتِ الْأُولَى أَحَقُّ بِالثَّانِيَةِ Because the first salam wasn't more important than the last salam, the ending salam. So salam when we see each other, salam when we are departing and leaving each other. The third point that we need to remember about the salam, and I'm not going to go into the details of salam, but in only the things that we are learning from this ayah. Otherwise, there is another ayah that talks about salam, inshallah, we can talk about it once we get there. But another point that we learned from this ayah about salam is even the wordings of salam should remain the same. As a person came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, Alayka salamu ya Rasulullah. Did he say anything wrong? No. Alayka salam ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, La taqul alayka salam. Don't say alayka salam. Because alayka salamu tahiyyatul amwat. When you visit the dead people in their graves, at their grave, when you go to the graveyard, you say, Alaykum as salam. But, Assalamu Alaikum is the greeting of the living people, so therefore use Assalamu Alaikum. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that Hayyawka bima lam yuhayyika bihillah. They greet you with the wordings in a, ta- in a way that Allah have not greeted you in that way. So we should use the same greeting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have used, and that is that we read in our tashahud. Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we know that this was the greeting offered to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the night that he was taken for mi'raj. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam added to that Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا جَاءُوكَ حَيَّوكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهِ When they come to you, they greet you in a way that Allah have not greeted you in that way. وَيَقُولُونَ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ لَوْ لَا يُعَذِّبُنَ اللَّهُ بِمَا نَقُولُ And they say to themselves, in their heart, they think, I have said, Assalamu alaikum to him. If he is a true messenger of Allah, how come Allah doesn't punish me for cursing him? وَيَقُولُونَ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ They say to themselves, لَوْ لَا يُعَذِّبُنَ اللَّهُ بِمَا نَقُولُ 
Why Allah doesn't punish us because of what we have been saying? Simply means that he cannot be a prophet, otherwise Allah will take revenge right away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm not impatient like you people. I'm not impatient. I have power, I have strength, but at the same time I'm a sabur, I have patience also. Hasbuhum Jahannam. Once I get you, you will never get out of it. Jahannam is enough for you people. I don't need to punish you over here now, right away. I don't need to send a punishment right away. An angel who will just uh, pick you and uh, throw you away at the same time. Who would smash your head at the same time. I don't need to do that at this time. I give you chance. I let you do even more. But once you get it, Hasbuhum Jahannam, that will be enough for you. Jahannam will be enough for you. Yaslawnaha, they will all get in it. Fabi'sal Masir is the worst destination. And here we need to remember also that many times we get impatient and we want Allah to act according to our will. But why Allah is not doing it? We question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is not coming? Why is not happening? We all are making dua, still we don't see the result. I've been making dua for the last many years, few years, and still I don't see no results. I don't see my dua being answered. There is sabr over there, he's a sabur. If we find human beings like us who have more patience than us, who have gone through so much more and much more than what we can even think. And they never complained. So of course, how can we imagine what is the patience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Therefore, we should never ask Allah to go according to our will. Ya Allah, do it because I want it. No. Ask Him, beg Him for it. But without getting impatient, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ Everyone's dua will be accepted as long as he will not become impatient. Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, what does it mean when you say he does not become impatient? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, if he would start complaining against Allah, that I'm asking and is not doing it, then he is impatient. Then Allah says, I'm not going to accept it because you are supposed to beg me, not order me. We are supposed to beg him, not order him. And he can never be ordered. No one can order Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam could never order Allah to do something, and Allah says in Quran al Kareem, وَزُلْزِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ Even Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam was shaken up, were shaken up so bad that the messenger and the people around him used to say when the help of Allah would come. So, no one can order Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are supposed to beg Allah. We are supposed to cry before Allah. We are supposed to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these people are thinking in their mind that if it was wrong, then Allah would have punished us. Why Allah doesn't punish us because of our statements that we are making that Allah, because of what we are saying to Prophet sallallahu alayhi we are cursing at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so the punishment should come right away. Allah says, no, no, no. This is not my rule. I don't punish people right away. We know that Nuh alayhi salatu was was rejected 950 years. People on his face are cursing at him. 950 years. <coughs> not few years, not 10, not 20. 950 years. And he's hearing all of this. And then only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes revenge from those, from the rejectors. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, we should never become impatient. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha tanajaytum 
فلا تتناجوا بالاثم والعدوان ومعصيه الرسول او يو هو بليف when you hold your secret conversations your private talks and conversations make sure لا تتناجوا بالاثم والعدوان do not talk about sin about animosity and about doing wrong to others and about disobeying the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we will hold a meeting whether to perform four salah from now on or five salah because we don't have no one to come for the salah so we'll make it we'll announce it that we'll make only four salah a day from nowadays don't hold any secret talks about sin about doing wrong to others and about disobeying the messenger alayhi salatu wassalam yes if you want to hold a secret talk then under one condition wa tanajaw bil birri wa taqwa do it for righteousness and for piety talk to each other and when you're holding these private talks then it should be only about how to do something good how to benefit people how to help people and at taqwa about piety how to get close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how to obey allah how to obey the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa taqul allah alladhi ilayhi tuhsharun fear allah to whom all of you will be returning and you will be gathering before him inna man najwa min ash-shaytan that type of conversation that doesn't have bir and taqwa doesn't have anything that is about righteousness and about piety then that type of conversation is from shaitan why liyahzun alladhina amanu so that he may cause a grief to the people of iman that these people are talking about us these people are having meetings about us to hurt us just like what we just heard in the beginning ayahs they used to talk about the muslims so in najwa min ash-shaytan those type of secret meetings and me secret conversations are from shaytan liyahzun alladhina amanu to cause this type of grief to the believers to the mu'minin wa laysa bi darrihim shay'a subhanallah allah puts us in ease by telling us wa laysa bi darrihim shay'an illa bi idhnillah he can never harm the believers without the permission of allah whatever has to happen to us will happen to us even if they don't have those type of meetings and in spite of all of those meetings and plannings if allah doesn't plan to hurt the person nothing will happen to the person wa laysa bi darrihim shay'an illa bi idhnillah wa 'ala allahi falyatawakkal almu'minun and the people of iman and people of belief should put their trust only in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when these type of things are taking place allah says you can do nothing about it they are choking you can't stop them from talking they are planning you can't stop them from planning so now what this is what you can do wa 'ala allah falyatawakkal almu'minun the people of iman should put their trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we talked about these private conversations i would mention few hadith that will give us some lessons about it or some directions and understanding and rules of it rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have said in a hadith which is in sahih al bukhari and muslim idha kuntum thalatha fala yatanaja ithnan dun al thalith when there are three people two people should not whisper to each other keeping the third person away because fa inna dhalika yuhzinuhu because he will feel bad about it that you two are talking about he doesn't know what you're talking about and he is the only person that's over there so it might be about him so that will put him in that situation of thinking i don't know what they're talking about are they talking about something about me or what it is so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gives us that instruction that we are not allowed we should not do this when there are three people to that two of them will hold a private conversation and they will whisper to each other and keeping the third person away 
There is another narration in Sahih al-Bukhari where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says one more additional thing and that is that two people should not be whispering to each other illa bi-idhnihi except with his permission. If you tell him, you know, I have to ask him something private if you don't mind. He says, okay, that's fine. Now you go ahead and do it. So take his permission before you do it. And if he says, you know, why would you want me to feel bad? Then he has the right to do so. And you shouldn't feel bad about it. At the same time, we learn from this, that when there are more than three people, he has someone that he can talk to also. Now, when two people need to talk to each other, they are allowed, and these third and the fourth people that are there, which means the other people that are there, should not feel bad about it. And they should not take it personal, should not take it, take it upon themselves, that he or they must be talking about me. This is one of the worst things that we have. You see two people talking in the must, it must be about me. As once we talked about a situation, and after the talk, one of the brothers in a khutbah, in a lecture before the khutbah, about all the wrongdoings that we do nowadays in our marriages, one of the brothers said, were you talking about me? I said, you were not that important to me that I will hold the whole khutbah about you. <laughs> and if you did it, then I meant you for sure. Because everyone that is doing that, I meant all of those people. Because if we are doing something wrong, then Allah is talking to us when He says, you are getting the sin, then Prophet wasallam is talking to us. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. At his time, there was another great tabi'i, very well known, whose name was as Sufyan al Thawri rahimahullah. Great scholar of Islam. Once someone went to as Sufyan al Thawri rahimahullah and asked him, What do you think about Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah? So it's nothing new when you have two scholars and people are trying to create some hatred and trying to take the words from here to there, create animosity, bad feelings. And that person, he knew what this person is expecting. He knew that the person is expecting the Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah to say, oh, he's not that good, he's not that knowledgeable, I'm more knowledgeable than him. So, just to see how he, this person is willing, is looking forward to have his expectation being fulfilled, he said to him, I know Imam Abu Hanifa very well. He is a very miser person. Now that person started looking at him. He was expecting to, that he would attack his knowledge, his piety, something else. But he knew this is something known about him that he is very generous. So he said to him, you know, I was expecting something different, but you know, we all know that he is not miser, he is generous. He says to him, no, he is very miser. <coughs> he wants to give this person a good lesson. So the person says, no, I know him, he's generous. In one gathering, he gives his students thousands of dollars. He is very generous. As far as that thing is there, I know it. So, Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah said, what I mean by him being very miser is, he doesn't want to share his jannah with anyone else. I have never heard him or seen him backbiting anyone. And everyone else talks about him. So he takes everyone's reward, but he's not willing to give anyone his reward. He's very miser. And if you want me to give him my reward, I'm not willing to do that. Because he's holding his to himself, I'm not going to give him mine either. So, a beautiful lesson for us. That Allah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as he's teaching us, these are that. So two people should not be talking, whispering to each other without the third. But when there are more than two, 
then let them do it and don't take it upon yourself. Oh, they must be talking about me. These type of thinking, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna ba'da dhanni ithm, that some of time these thoughts are sin also. Because they lead to the sin that you always think about others, that this person might be thinking about me, he might be laughing at me, he might be talking about me and against me. This is all bad. This is from shaitan. It has nothing to do with facts because shaitan through these type of thoughts would like to create animosity between the uh, ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep all of us on surat al-mustaqeem. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.